Chapter 1. Irrational Exuberance. Seven Habits of Highly Defective Investors. Fortune, December 29, 1997. I like the theory of efficient financial markets as much as anyone. I don't begrudge Robert Merton and Myron Scholes the Nobel Prize they just received for showing how that theory can help you price complex financial instruments. But unless you spent the past five months in a Tibetan monastery, you must have noticed that markets have been behaving pretty strangely of late. As recently as June, the miracle economies of Southeast Asia could do no wrong. Investors cheerfully put billions into local stock markets. By October, those same investors were in full flight. After all, everyone could see how corrupt and badly managed those economies were. When the IMF and the World Bank held their September meeting in Hong Kong, everyone congratulated the hosts on their economic policies, which had insulated them from the turmoil to the South and maintained prosperity through the handover to China. A month later, Hong Kong had not only crashed, but had briefly brought Brazil and much of the rest of the world down with it. What is the market up to? Well, I recently had a chance to listen to the market, or at least a fairly large part of it, when I attended a meeting of money managers. Collectively, they control several hundred billion dollars, so when they talked, I listened. Mainly, I wanted to know why such smart men and women, and they must be smart because if they aren't smart, why are they rich, do such foolish things. Here's what I learned, the seven habits that help produce the anything but efficient markets that rule the world. One. Think short-term. A few people in that meeting tried to talk about the long-term, about what kind of earnings growth U.S. corporations might be able to achieve over the next five years. This sort of thing was brushed aside as too academic. But wait, any economist will tell you that even a short-term investor should look at the long run. This year's stock price depends on this year's earnings, plus what people think the price will be next year but next year's price will depend on next year's earnings plus what people next year expect the price to be the following year, and so on. Today's price, then, should take into account earnings prospects well into the future. Try telling that to the practitioners. 2. Be greedy. Many of the people kept talking about how they expected a final melt-up in prices before the big correction, and how they planned to ride the market up for a while longer. Well, maybe they were right. But if you really think stocks are overvalued, how confident should you be about your ability to time the inevitable plunge? Trying to get those extra few percent could be a very expensive proposition. 3. Believe in the greater fool. Several money managers argued that Asian markets have been oversold, but that one shouldn't buy in until those markets start to turn around, just as others argued that the U.S. market is overvalued, but they didn't plan to sell until the market started to weaken. The obvious question was, if it becomes clear to you that the market has turned around, won't it be clear to everyone else? Implicitly, they all seemed to believe that the strategy was safe, because there is always someone else dense enough not to notice until it really is too late. 4. Run with the herd. You might have expected that a group of investors would have been interested to hear contrarian views from someone who suggested that the U.S. is on the verge of serious inflationary problems or that Japan is poised for a rapid economic recovery, or that the European Monetary Union is going to fail, which would have offered a nice challenge to conventional wisdom. But no, the few timid contrarians were ridiculed. The group apparently wanted conventional wisdom reinforced, not challenged. 5. Overgeneralize. I was amazed to hear the group condemn Japanese companies as uncompetitive, atrociously managed, unable to focus on the bottom line. But surely it can't be true of all Japanese companies. Guys who manage to export even at 80 yen to the dollar must have at least a few tricks up their sleeves. And wasn't it only a couple of years ago that Japanese management techniques were the subject of hundreds of adulatory books and articles? They were never really that good, but surely they are better than their current reputation. 6. Be trendy. I came to the meeting expecting to hear a lot about the new economic paradigm which asserts that technology and globalization mean that all the old rules have been repealed, that the inflation-free growth of the past six years will continue indefinitely, that we are at the start of a 20-year boom, etc. That doctrine is basically nonsense, of course. But anyway, I quickly determined that it is, as they say on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so five minutes ago. All the rules have changed again. Now we stand on the brink of a dreadful epoch of global deflation, 
and despite its previous track record of engineering recoveries, there is nothing the Fed can do about it. You see, it's a new, new economy. 7. Play with other people's money. If, as I said, the people at that meeting were very smart, why did they act in ways that seemed so foolish? Part of the answer, I suspect, is that they are employees, not principals. They are trying to make money and careers for themselves. In that position, it is hard to take a long view. In the long run, even if you aren't dead, you probably won't be working in the same place. It is also difficult for someone managing other people's money to take an independent line. To be wrong when everyone else is wrong is not such a terrible thing. You may lose a bonus, but probably not your job. On the other hand, to be wrong when everyone else is right. So everyone focuses on the same short-term numbers, tries to ride the trends, and buys the silly economic theory du jour. Listening to all that money talking made me very nervous. After all, these people can funnel money into a country's markets, then abruptly pull that money out, and create a boom-bust cycle of pretty spectacular proportions. I don't think they can do it to the U.S. In Greenspan, I trust, but I'm not 100% sure. One thing that I am sure of is that the Asian leaders who have been fulminating against the evil machinations of speculators have it wrong. What I saw in that room was not a predatory pack of speculative wolves. It was an extremely dangerous flock of financial sheep. Money for Nothing May 28, 2000 Economists don't usually make good speculators because they think too much. Like the famous, if apocryphal, professor who refused to pick up a $100 bill, they tend to assume that if there were money to be had, somebody would already have taken it. However, caution that can be a liability on the trading floor is an asset off it. Sometimes the observant do spot opportunities for large risk-free gain, $100 bills lying in the street, that others have somehow missed. But a wise man doesn't assume that such opportunities will present themselves on a regular basis, and he certainly doesn't use that assumption as a basis for his family budget or his plan to save Social Security. It is a fact that historically stocks have been a very good investment. The best-known demonstration of that fact comes from Jeremy Siegel of the University of Pennsylvania, who has pointed out in his book, Stocks for the Long Run, that during the 20th century, anyone who was willing to buy and hold for long periods would almost always have done better buying stocks than bonds. So there wasn't a trade-off between risk and return. Stocks were just a better investment, period. It turns out that there was a $100 bill lying on the sidewalk, quite a few billion bills, actually, that for some reason nobody picked up. But many people have misunderstood what that observation means. It doesn't say that there is some natural law guaranteeing that stocks will always be a great investment. It says that historically stocks have been underpriced. Investors weren't willing to pay as much for claims on corporate earnings as they would have if they had properly understood how low the risks were. And a funny thing happened on the way to the 21st century. The price-earnings ratio the price of a dollar of corporate earnings soared. In the period studied by Professor Siegel, prices were on average less than 15 times earnings, and stock investors on average earned a real return of 7%. Nowadays, the price-earnings ratio is on average more like 30. Is this irrational exuberance, or did investors finally absorb Professor Siegel's lesson? Either way, that $100 bill has now been picked up. If stock investors now have to pay twice as much as they used to for a claim on earnings, and if profits grow in the future as they have in the past, those investors should now expect to earn only half the historical rate of return. And yet many of those offering plans to reform Social Security, among them, of course, advisors to George W. Bush, insist that stocks are the answer, and that it is safe to assume that stocks will keep on yielding 7% forever. And if you try to point out that buying a piece of corporate America is much more expensive than it used to be, they just repeat the mantra that stocks have historically been a great investment. In other words, that $100 bill was there yesterday, so it must still be there, right? Is the odd susceptibility of first-rate economists to such a naive fallacy a triumph of wishful thinking over analysis or a disingenuous bow to political expediency? Recent remarks by Mr. Bush offer evidence of good old-fashioned American disingenuity at work. In a May 15th speech, he asked his listeners to consider this simple fact. Even if a worker chose only the safest investment in the world, 
an inflation-adjusted U.S. government bond, he or she would receive twice the rate of return of Social Security. That's an amazing fact. It's even more amazing when you realize that the Social Security system invests all its money in, you guessed it, U.S. government bonds. But the explanation, which Mr. Bush's advisors understand very well, even if the governor does not, is that today's workers are not only paying for their own retirement, but also supporting today's retirees. And if you think that's a minor detail, that the question of how to meet existing obligations when workers are allowed to invest their contributions elsewhere is a side issue, let me assure you that I too would have no trouble devising a painless plan to save Social Security if you would let me assume that a large part of the system's obligations would magically disappear. Or maybe magic isn't quite the right word. How about voodoo? Damaged by the Dow, September 2, 2001. In late 1999, about the time when George W. Bush first announced his tax cut plan, I had lunch at a beer and pizza joint, the sort of place that has a TV over the bar where the patrons can watch ESPN. But the TV wasn't tuned to ESPN. It was showing CNBC. I thought to myself, this will end badly, and it has. The Dow first passed 10,000 in 1999. Although the index briefly dropped below that milestone in early 2000, that decline didn't really count. It was a perverse side effect of truly irrational exuberance, as investors deserted the boring old Dow for the Nasdaq. Last week, on the other hand, was the real thing. A broad market decline carried the Dow past 10,000 in the wrong direction. The era of the stock market bubble has now well and truly ended, but what a mess that bubble has left behind. By now, the direct economic impact of the bubble is a familiar story. During the years of booming stock prices, which were closely linked to euphoria about the new economy, businesses invested frantically, sinking vast sums into information technology. Now, of course, many of those businesses realize that they invested far too much, and the overhang of excess capacity is likely to keep business investment depressed for years. That's not an encouraging thought, but the direct economic consequences of the bubble are only half the story. The bubble also had a dire effect on our national politics. After all, it wasn't an accident that the Bush tax plan was proposed just before the bubble popped. There was an intimate relationship between stock market mania and tax cut mania, a relationship that ran in both directions. On one side, in the late 1990s, the right-wing media were enthusiastic stock boosters. The editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, in particular, was extremely fond of crank theories about stock valuation as long as they pointed upward. Remember Dow 36,000? And anyone who pointed out that such theories rested on fuzzy math and suggested that stocks could not be counted on to deliver high returns forever was clearly a dangerous leftist. After all, the stock market is the purest expression of capitalism, so anyone who doubts that market must be anti-capitalist, right? But the more important causation ran the other way. The stock bubble, alas, provided an environment in which deeply irresponsible policy proposals temporarily looked plausible. It's important to realize how much of the late lamented budget surplus was the result of the bull market. Tax rates didn't increase between 1994 and 2000, but tax receipts as a share of GDP surged, largely because of the extra taxes paid on all those capital gains. The result was a false sense that there was plenty of money in hand, that big tax cuts would fit comfortably into the budget, and the Bush tax plan was formulated when such delusions were at their height. Now reality has started to sink in. Unfortunately, though the new realism may have come soon enough to prevent a disaster on Social Security, for Mr. Bush's other signature policy proposal was also based on the delusions of a bubble economy, it has come too late to prevent a disastrous tax cut. Of course, you might wonder why Mr. Bush himself didn't have second thoughts. Why he thought that the exact same tax plan he proposed in the feverish bull market days of late 1999 was still appropriate in the post-bubble economy of 2001. And his officials surely knew that tax receipts were dropping like a stone, even as they were reassuring a docile Congress that everything was just fine. But one thing we have learned about this administration is that it never responds to altered circumstances by changing its plans. All it does is change the sales pitch. 
so the tax cut was relabeled as a recession-fighting measure, a task for which it is peculiarly ill-suited. For that matter, the administration hasn't given up on Social Security privatization either. Now that it can no longer entice people with visions of stock market sugar plums, it has decided to scare them with imaginary crises instead. In any case, immense damage has already been done. The stock market bubble led to bad political decisions as well as bad business decisions, and will be paying the price for many years to come. Chapter 2. Portents Abroad Asia. What Went Wrong? Fortune, March 2, 1998. There is a part of me that is excited, even happy, about Asia's financial crisis. You see, financial disasters are one of my specialties. The very first serious economics paper I ever wrote, more than 20 years ago, was titled A Model of Balance of Payments Crises. And so I am a bit like a tornado chaser who has just caught up with a monster twister. I am as sorry as anyone about those poor people in the trailer park, but I am also more than a bit thrilled to have the chance to watch this amazing spectacle unfold. I can even offer an excuse for my mixed feelings. You learn a lot more about how the global economy works when something goes wrong than when everything hums along smoothly. And maybe the lessons we learn from this crisis will help us avoid, or at least cope better with, the next one. So what have we learned from Asia's mess? Speculative attacks on currencies are nothing new, and some of us even warned a couple of years ago that Southeast Asian countries might be at risk. But the scale and depth of this crisis have surprised everyone. This disaster has demonstrated that there are financial dangers undreamt of in our previous philosophy. By now, we have a pretty good idea of what happened to Asia. Think of it so far as a play in two acts, the first about reckless behavior and the second about its consequences. What nobody knows yet is how close we are to the end. Is the play almost over, or is there a tragic final act still to follow? The first act was the story of the bubble. It began, we now think, with bad banking. In all of the countries that are currently in crisis, there was a fuzzy line at best between what was public and what was private. The minister's nephew or the president's son could open a bank and raise money both from the domestic populace and from foreign lenders, with everyone believing that their money was safe because official connections stood behind the institution. Government guarantees on bank deposits are standard practice throughout the world, but normally these guarantees come with strings attached. The owners of banks have to meet capital requirements, that is, put a lot of their own money at risk, restrict themselves to prudent investments, and so on. In Asian countries, however, too many people seem to have been granted privilege without responsibility, allowing them to play a game of heads I win, tails somebody else loses. And the loans financed highly speculative real estate ventures and wildly overambitious corporate expansions. The bubble was inflated still further by credulous foreign investors, who were all too eager to put money into faraway countries about which they knew nothing, except that they were thriving. It was also, for a while, self-sustaining. All those irresponsible loans created a boom in real estate and stock markets, which made the balance sheets of banks and their clients look much healthier than they were. Soon enough, Asia was set up for the second act, the bursting of the bubble. The bursting had to happen sooner or later. At some point, it was going to become clear that the Panglossian values Asian markets had placed on assets weren't realistic in this imperfect world, that Asian conglomerates are no better than their Western counterparts at trying to be in every business in every country. But the collapse came sooner rather than later because speculative bubbles are vulnerable to self-fulfilling pessimism. As soon as a significant number of investors begin to wonder whether the bubble will burst, it does. So Asia went into a downward spiral. As nervous investors began to pull their money out of banks, asset prices plunged. As asset prices fell, it became increasingly doubtful whether governments would really stand behind the deposits and loans that remained, and investors fled all the faster. Foreign investors stampeded for the exits, forcing currency devaluations, which worsened the crisis still more as banks and companies found themselves with assets in devalued baht or rupiah, but with liabilities in lamentably solid dollars. What actually started this downward spiral? Who cares? Any little thing can set off an avalanche 
once the conditions are right. Probably the proximate causes were a slump in the semiconductor market and a rise in the dollar-yen exchange rate. But if they hadn't triggered the crisis, something else would have. Asia's financial implosion is, of course, dragging the real economies down with it. Partly, that's because the collapse of asset values is making people feel poorer, depressing consumer demand. Partly, it's because low stock prices and high interest rates are depressing investment. But there is also, disturbingly, a supply-side effect. Although runaway banks were the original source of the mess, a functioning banking system remains a crucial lubricant for the economic engine. With banking in some Asian countries effectively paralyzed, that engine is showing signs of seizing up. Even companies that should be profitable, like exporters, are finding themselves hamstrung by lack of credit. It is, in short, a terrible but also fascinating spectacle. Could it get worse? If there is a third act, it will involve the interaction of economics and politics. Economic crisis will lead to political instability. Instability will lead to capital flight that reinforces the economic crisis. And all heck will break loose. But so far, only Indonesia shows even faint signs of such a new vicious circle. And even there, most sensible observers think that the risks of really serious unrest have been exaggerated. I hope they are right. For economic tornado chasers, Asia's disaster may have been a perfect storm. But anyone who cares seriously about the real people whose livelihoods, and in some cases lives, are now at risk can only hope that the storm will soon be over. We're Not Japan, December 27, 2000 When Lucy tells Charlie Brown that this time she really is going to let him kick that football, you know what's going to happen. When Wiley Coyote insists that this time he really is going to catch the Roadrunner, you know what's going to happen. And when Japanese officials tell you that this time their nation really is on the road to self-sustaining recovery... A new clutch of indicators confirms that, sure enough, Japan's economy is stalling yet again. Business confidence has gone flat, consumer spending is falling, unemployment is rising, deflation is accelerating, and the Nikkei stock index, which was over 20,000 earlier this year, is now oscillating around 14,000. For Japan, it's the same old story, but with the U.S. economy going through its roughest patch in years with panicky analysts and self-interested politicians declaring that the sky is falling, maybe it's worth explaining why our story remains very different. You see, the general rule, the rule to which Japan is the great exception, is that recessions are not a serious problem for large modern economies. It's not that the forces that cause recessions have been abolished, though every long expansion brings foolish proclamations of the end of business cycles. Rather, the point is that recessionary tendencies can usually be effectively treated with cheap, over-the-counter medication. Cut interest rates a couple of percentage points, provide plenty of liquidity, and call me in the morning. Or more accurately, call me in six months, or maybe as much as a year. Experience suggests that the Fed can almost always persuade consumers and businesses to spend more by cutting interest rates, but that there's a longish lag between the rate cut and the spending increase. And that's why we're still vulnerable to recessions. Now and then the Fed gets behind the curve, failing to recognize a weakening economy until it's too late to prevent a slump. That's what happened in 1990. It may be what's happening now. Specifically, it's now pretty clear that the Fed went an interest rate hike too far, that while it was right to raise rates in late 1999 and early 2000 to cool off a red-hot economy, that last half percentage point increase in May was overkill. Of course, I'm talking with the benefit of hindsight. It seemed like a good idea at the time. The Fed can and almost surely will reverse that rate hike sometime soon. But the favorable effects of that reversal on spending will take time to materialize. Meanwhile, the economy will slow and could shrink for a couple of quarters, which is the technical definition of a recession. But it should be only a temporary setback, which brings us to the difference between ourselves and Japan. In Japan, the sky really is falling. Because the interest rate is already very close to zero, it isn't quite zero because of the Bank of Japan's foolish decision to raise rates back in August, but don't get me started. The slowdown is a sign that the nation's basic economic policies aren't working, and that it is long past time to do something radical. By contrast, our slowdown is just one of those things that happen now and then. It doesn't indicate any fundamental flaws in our economic policy, 
any need to do anything except cut interest rates. So what should we be afraid of? The nightmare scenario, which cannot be completely ruled out, is that we will turn out to be more like Japan than we think, that we have just gone through our own version of the infamous bubble economy, and that we are about to find out that this time cutting interest rates won't do the trick. But at this point, that scenario isn't very plausible. What worries me is not the recession that we may or may not be about to experience. It is the way that our politicians are likely to react to that slowdown. Will they use a mild, easily treated ailment as an excuse to force expensive, dangerous quack remedies down the nation's throat? I am, of course, talking about tax cuts, which won't cure the short-term slowdown and will undermine our long-run fiscal health. We don't need to fear a recession. If it does happen, it's something that the Fed can easily cure. What we do need to fear is fear itself, the all-too-likely prospect that the threat of recession will panic us into doing things we will regret for years to come. 11 and Counting, December 14, 2001 Embarrassing but true. Just one month ago, the James A. Baker III Institute presented Alan Greenspan with its Enron Prize. I'm not suggesting any impropriety. It was just another indication of how deeply the failed energy company was enmeshed with our ruling elite. And yet, Mr. Greenspan also finds himself in Chapter 11. That is, the Fed has now cut interest rates 11 times and has yet to see any results. What's going on? One answer is that something has gone wrong with the monetary transmission mechanism, the drivetrain that normally links the Fed's actions with the real economy. And one of the people who stripped the Fed's gears is Mr. Greenspan himself. The Fed's direct power over the economy is actually more limited than is widely appreciated. People often say that the Fed controls interest rates, but what it actually controls is only an interest rate, the rate in the overnight federal funds market. And this interest rate is, in itself, of very little economic importance. Normally, however, a fall in the federal funds rate affects financial variables that do matter. It leads to higher stock prices, a weaker dollar, and, above all, lower long-term interest rates. Goldman Sachs economists have incorporated these variables into a financial conditions index that, they show, has historically done a very good job of predicting future economic performance. Based on past experience, you would have expected the Fed's dramatic rate cuts since January to lower the Goldman Sachs index by about five points, enough to produce a roaring 2002. In fact, however, the index has fallen only about half a point, largely because long-term interest rates have not fallen at all. The Fed, in other words, is getting almost no bang for its bucks. Why? Part of the explanation is self-defeating optimism. Bond traders continue to believe, despite mounting evidence to the contrary, that Mr. Greenspan is a magician, that he will soon conjure up another dramatic boom, and will then raise interest rates to cool a red-hot economy. Ironically, this very belief helps keep long-term rates high and thus ensures that no such boom seems imminent. And then there's the federal budget. Just months ago, we were dazzled with projections of huge federal surpluses. There was enough money, the Bush administration insisted, to have a big tax cut, increase spending, and still pay off the federal debt. But on Tuesday, Paul O'Neill quietly asked Congress to raise the federal government's debt ceiling something he had previously said would not be necessary until 2008 at the earliest. Has the sudden return of federal deficits had an impact on long-term interest rates? Of course it has. Just a few months ago, everyone expected the federal government to pay off its debt, drastically reducing the supply of bonds. Now it turns out that it will actually be borrowing money. Inevitably, this depresses bond prices, which is the same as raising long-term interest rates. So the rapid deterioration of federal finances is part of Mr. Greenspan's problem. Has the negative impact of the tax cut on the economy via its effect on interest rates outweighed the positive effect on consumer spending? Yes, on any reasonable calculation. Mr. Greenspan, then, finds himself with much less ability to move the economy than anyone expected. And it's partly his own fault. After all, he did much to cultivate the mystique that now turns out to be a handicap. And let's not forget that he intervened decisively on behalf of large tax cuts back in January, when he urged Congress to prevent what he then saw as a great risk, 
that surpluses would be too large and that the federal debt would be paid off too quickly. It might be helpful if Mr. Greenspan would now say something to dampen self-defeating belief in a sudden economic turnaround. It would be even more helpful if he would concede, however indirectly, that he gave Congress bad advice last January. That might prepare the ground for an eventual return to fiscal responsibility. But the Fed chairman, who was quite willing to intervene in fiscal politics when that was helpful to the Bush administration, has gone oddly silent on the subject now that those surplus projections turn out to have been bad science fiction. Maybe Mr. Greenspan deserved that Enron Prize after all. Living with Bears, July 23, 2002 It looks as if the authors of Dow 36,000, remember that? may have had one digit too many in their title. Let's just hope that it was an extra three, not an extra zero. The bull market is now well and truly over. In fact, if you adjust for inflation, the S&P 500, a much better measure than the overused Dow, is now below its level in late 1996, when Alan Greenspan gave his famous irrational exuberance speech. So what should the responsible officials, Mr. Greenspan, George W. Bush, and what's-his-name, the Treasury Secretary, be doing. A good first step would be to stop trying to talk up the market by extolling the economy's fundamental strength. For one thing, it reeks of desperation. For another, stocks are still richly valued compared with earnings. Most important, the fundamentals aren't actually all that great. Doubts about corporate governance are growing, not fading away. State and local governments are in a desperate fiscal crisis. And even before the sudden plunge in the markets, the data were pointing not to a boom, but to a jobless recovery, in which the economy grows too slowly to make much, if any, dent in the unemployment rate. Indeed, the report prepared in support of Mr. Greenspan's recent testimony projected no significant decline in unemployment this year, and not much decline next year. And in the face of plunging markets, we have to worry whether even that forecast is overly optimistic. Given the definitely iffy economic outlook, shouldn't Mr. Greenspan be thinking seriously about another interest rate cut? True, rates are already very low. But if there's one thing we've learned from Japan's experience, it is that when you face the risk of a deflationary trap, still not the most likely scenario, but not as unlikely as it seemed a few months ago, it makes no sense to save your ammunition, holding interest rate cuts in reserve. The time to fight deflation is before it has time to get built into the nation's psychology. True, the Fed has been concerned that another cut would panic the markets. But now that the markets have panicked on their own, there's nothing to lose. What about the rest of the government? Corporate reform is essential. If investors cannot be reassured that they are being treated fairly, they will take their money and go home. But we can't count on reform to provide an immediate boost to the economy. Trust, once lost cannot be restored in a moment. What else can the government do? Let's ignore the politics and look at the situation objectively. On one side, thanks in part to the end of the bull market, the long-run federal budget outlook has worsened to an extent that has surpassed the expectations of even the biggest pessimists like yours truly. Realistically, we are looking at a decade of deficits, which will eventually pose serious problems for Social Security and Medicare. On the other hand, with the recovery still wobbly, this is no time for fiscal austerity. If anything, right now the federal government ought to be pumping more money into the economy than it is. The obvious answer to this seeming dilemma is to loosen the reins now, but prepare to tighten them once the economy has fully recovered. For example, the Bush administration could move quickly to aid distressed state governments, avoiding harsh and contractionary cuts in essential programs. Meanwhile, to assuage worries about the long-run fiscal position, it could put on hold future tax cuts that were written into law back when visions of surplus sugar plums were still dancing in our heads. And after the administration takes these responsible steps, thousands of pigs will fill the skies over Washington. Look at it this way. The Bush administration's economic plans have not changed significantly since the fall of 1999, when they were introduced as a way to ward off a challenge from Steve Forbes. Back when the tax cut that eventually became law was announced, Dow 36,000 was climbing the bestseller lists. The economic environment has changed completely. The administration's plans haven't changed a bit. 
Our economic problems are real, but by no means catastrophic. What scares me is the utter inflexibility of the people who should be solving those problems. Stocks and Bombs, September 13, 2002 This stock market situation, what are the military options? That was the caption of a New Yorker cartoon last month. But these days, reality has a way of outrunning satire. Way back in June, the CNBC pundit Larry Kudlow published a column in the Washington Times with the headline, Taking Back the Market by Force. In it, he argued for an invasion of Iraq to boost the Dow. Pretty amazing stuff, though not as amazing as the July column in the New York Post by John Podhoretz, whose headline read, October surprise, please, followed by the injunction, go on, Mr. President, wag the dog. In general, it's a bad omen when advocates of a policy claim that it will solve problems unrelated to its original purpose. The shifting rationale for the Bush tax cut. It's about giving back the surplus. No, it's a demand stimulus. No, it's a supply-side policy. Should have warned us that this was an obsession in search of a justification. The shifting rationale for war with Iraq. Saddam was behind September 11th and the anthrax attacks. No, but he's on the verge of developing nuclear weapons. No, but he's a really evil man, which he is, has a similar feel. The idea that war would actually be good for the economy seems like just one more step in this progression. But one must admit that there are times when war has had positive economic effects. In particular, there's no question that World War II pulled the United States out of the Great Depression. And today's U.S. economy, while not in a depression, could certainly use some help. The latest evidence suggests a recovery so slow and uneven that it feels like a continuing recession. So is war the answer? No. World War II is a very poor model for the economic effects of a new war in the Persian Gulf. On balance, such a war is much more likely to depress than to stimulate our struggling economy. There's nothing magical about military spending. It provides no more economic stimulus than the same amount spent on, say, cleaning up toxic waste sites. The reason World War II accomplished what the New Deal could not was simply that war removed the usual inhibitions. Until Pearl Harbor, Franklin Roosevelt didn't have the determination or the legislative clout to enact really large programs to stimulate the economy. But war made it not just possible but necessary for the government to spend on a previously inconceivable scale, restoring full employment for the first time since 1929. By contrast, this time around, Congress is eager to spend on domestic projects. If the administration wants to pump money into the economy, all it needs to do is drop its objections to things like drought aid for farmers and new communication gear for firefighters. In other words, if the economy needs a burst of federal spending, neither economics nor politics requires that this burst take the form of a war. And in any case, it's not clear how much stimulus war would provide. One assumes that the necessary munitions are already in stock, so there will be no surge in factory orders. There will be spending on peacekeeping, won't there? But it will be spread over many years. Meanwhile, there is the potential economic downside, which may be summed up in one word, oil. Iraq itself currently supplies so little oil to the world market that wartime disruption of its production would pose little problem. But neither the Arab-Israeli War of 1973 nor the Iranian Revolution of 1979 directly affected oil production. Instead, the indirect political repercussions of conflict were what caused oil prices to surge. This time around, Arab leaders have warned that an invasion of Iraq would open the gates of hell. That doesn't sound good for the oil market. It's worth remembering that each of the oil crises of the 1970s was followed by a severe recession, and that the milder oil price spike before the Gulf War was also followed by a recession. Could rising crude prices undermine our weak economic recovery, creating a double-dip recession? Yes. None of this should deter us from invading Iraq if the administration makes a convincing case that we should do so for security reasons. But it's foolish and dangerous to minimize the potential economic consequences of war let alone claim that it will be good for the economy. The Vision Thing, September 20th, 2002. 
This is the way the recovery ends. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Okay, I could be wrong. Industrial production is falling, and layoffs are rising. But it's still not a sure thing that the months ahead will be bad enough for the business cycle referees to declare a renewed recession. And on the other hand, the administration seems determined to have a bang sometime before November 5th. But right now, it looks as if the economy is stalling, and also as if the people in charge have no idea what to do. In short, it's feeling a lot like the early 1990s. It doesn't really matter whether you call what's going on right now a slow recovery or a recession. Most people don't care whether GDP growth is slightly above or below zero. What matters to them is whether they can find jobs and keep them. And the job situation is increasingly dismal. A 5.7% unemployment rate doesn't sound that bad, but an unusually large number of workers have given up searching for jobs. The overall unemployment rate also doesn't reflect the rapidly growing number of people who are truly desperate because they have been out of work for six months or more. And the employment situation has lately taken a significant turn for the worse. The number of people filing new claims for unemployment insurance, a leading indicator of future unemployment, has increased sharply over the past month. At best, then, this is a recovery that, as far as ordinary workers are concerned, might as well be a continuing recession. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities points out that in terms of job losses and long-term unemployment, the current slowdown is already a match for the nasty recession of the early 1990s. So this really is like the early 1990s all over again. The economic similarity between our current difficulties and the slump under the first George Bush is stronger than most people realize. In 1990, as in 2001, the economy went into a recession in part because of past excesses, though those quaint old scandals involving junk bonds and real estate speculation seem very tame in the age of Enron and Tyco. In the early 1990s, as today, recession was followed by a jobless recovery in which GDP grew, but employment didn't. And then, as now, there was concern that interest rate cuts by the Fed might not be enough to turn the economy around, although back then we didn't yet have the example of Japan to show that the liquidity trap, in which even a zero interest rate isn't enough to produce an economic recovery, was a real possibility in the modern world. But the most striking similarity between now and a decade ago, it seems to me, is political. For all the differences between the moderate father and the deeply conservative son, now as then, we have an administration whose key figures are fundamentally uninterested in and uncomfortable with economic policy. That statement may strike you as strange. Wasn't the tax cut George W. Bush's central achievement before Osama bin Laden came along? But the tax cut was never intended as an economic policy. It was a political gesture designed to ward off a challenge from Steve Forbes and satisfy the conservative base. Only later did the administration make the providential discovery that it was also just the thing to fight recession, promote family values, and cure the common cold. And it can't seem to come up with anything else, now that the tax cut that wasn't designed to fight a recession has, sure enough, failed to fight a recession. When Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill was asked for new ideas that came out of the comical Waco summit, his answer was, are you ready? Making the tax cut permanent. Should we be worried about the administration's lack of the vision thing when it comes to economics? Yes, we should. The excesses of the 1990s dwarfed those of the 1980s, and the economic risks are correspondingly larger. Suppose that, as seems increasingly plausible, the deteriorating job situation finally undermines the dogged optimism of America's consumers. In that case, we'll need some decisive action, action determined by what the economy needs, not by what Karl Rove thinks will play in the polls. How much chance is there that we'll get it? My Economic Plan, October 4th, 2002. Although other news has been drowned out by the barking of the dogs of war, something ominous is happening on the economic front. It's not dramatic, but month by month, the numbers keep coming in worse than expected. Let's put politics completely aside for once, and review where we are and what should be done. The key point is that this isn't your father's recession. It's your grandfather's recession. That is, it isn't your standard post-war recession, 
engineered by the Federal Reserve to fight inflation, and easily reversed when the Fed loosens the reins. It's a classic overinvestment slump, of a kind that was normal before World War II. And such slumps have always been hard to fight simply by cutting interest rates. Now, there's no question that the Fed's rapid rate reductions last year helped avert a much bigger slump. But a hard look at monetary policy suggests that the Fed hasn't done enough, and possibly can't do enough. Although the Fed funds rate, the usual measure of monetary policy, is at its lowest level in generations, the real Fed funds rate, the interest rate minus the inflation rate, which is what matters for investment decisions, is actually about the same as it was at the bottom of the last recession in the early 1990s, because inflation is considerably lower. And the drop in the Fed funds rate, engineered by Alan Greenspan and company, though faster than that in the last recession, has so far been considerably smaller. Last time it fell by 6.75 points. This time it fell by only 4.75. Even if the Fed funds rate falls all the way to zero, that will be a smaller interest rate reduction than the last time around. If you think the excesses of the 1990s were larger than those of the 1980s, that the economy needs more stimulus to pull itself out, then it seems likely that the Fed hasn't done enough, and quite possible that even going all the way to zero still won't be enough. And this situation may last for a while. The overhang of excess capacity, especially in telecommunications, will be worked off only slowly. It's all too possible that we may be looking at a sluggish economy into 2004, maybe beyond. The Fed should cut rates further. It may not be enough, but it will help. What else should we do? The answer is that we should have a sensible plan for fiscal stimulus, one that encourages spending now to bridge the gap until business investment revives. Some of the elements of such a plan are obvious and were described by Jeff Madrick in the New York Times of October 3rd, 2002. First, extend unemployment benefits, which are considerably less generous now than in the last recession. This will do double duty, helping some of the neediest while putting money into the hands of people who are likely to spend it. Second, provide aid to the states, which are in increasingly desperate fiscal straits. This will also do double duty, preventing harsh cuts in public services with medical care for the poor the most likely target at the same time that it boosts demand. If these elements don't add up to a large enough sum, I agree with Mr. Madrick that $100 billion over the next year is a good target. Why not have another rebate, this time going to everyone who pays payroll taxes? And how will we pay for all of this? You know the answer to that. Cancel tax cuts scheduled for the future. The economy needs stimulus now. It doesn't need tax cuts for the very affluent five years from now. This isn't rocket science. It's straightforward textbook economics applied to our actual situation. It's also, I'm well aware, politically out of the question. But I think we're entitled to ask why. Chapter 4. Crony Capitalism, USA. Crony Capitalism, USA. January 15, 2002. Four years ago, as Asia struggled with an economic crisis, many observers blamed crony capitalism. Wealthy businessmen in Asia didn't bother to tell investors the truth about their assets, their liabilities, or their profits. The aura of invincibility that came from their political connections was enough. Only when a financial crisis came along did people take a hard look at their businesses, which promptly collapsed. Does this sound familiar? On the face of it, the sudden political storm over Enron is puzzling. After all, the Bush administration didn't save the company from bankruptcy. But then why did the administration dissemble so long about its contacts with Enron? Why did George W. Bush make the absurd claim that Enron's CEO, Kenneth Lay, opposed him in his first run for governor, and that the two men got to know each other only after that race? And why does the press act as if there may be a major scandal brewing? Because the administration fears and the press suspects that the latest revelations in the Enron affair will raise the lid on crony capitalism, American style. Cronyism is hardly novel in America. The Clinton administration took us to the edge of a trade war on behalf of Chiquita Bananas, a major campaign contributor. But the Bush administration, with its sense of entitlement, seems unconcerned by even the most blatant conflicts of interest, like the plan of Mark Rasko 
the new chairman of the Republican National Committee, to continue drawing a seven-figure salary as a lobbyist. He now says he won't lobby, but he will still receive that salary. The real questions about Enron's relationship with the administration involve what happened before the energy trader hit the skids. That's when Mr. Lay allegedly told the head of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that he should be more cooperative if he wanted to keep his job. He wasn't, and he didn't. And it's when Enron helped Dick Cheney devise an energy plan that certainly looks as if it was written by and for the companies that advised his task force. Mr. Cheney, in clear defiance of the law, has refused to release any information about his task force's deliberations. What is he hiding? And while Enron has imploded, other energy companies retain the administration's ear. Just days before the latest Enron revelations, the government signaled its intention to weaken pollution rules on power plants. Late last week, it announced its decision to proceed with a controversial plan to store radioactive waste in Nevada. Each of these decisions was worth billions to companies with very strong connections to Mr. Bush. CBSMarketWatch.com declared in its story about the nuclear waste decision that one group of major energy business political donors just hit the jackpot. Notice the source of that quote. In recent months, while political reporters have been busy waving the flag, business reporters have taken the lead in telling us what's really going on, and they seem disgusted by what they see. It was CBS Market Watch as executive director, not some whining political commentator, who warned that a small group of business leaders exert enormous clout over Bush and his team in getting the rules changed to their benefit. And the business magazine Red Herring has published the biggest expose to date of the secretive Carlyle Group, an investment company whose story sounds like the plot of a bad TV series. Carlyle specializes in buying down-and-out defense contractors, then reselling them when their fortunes miraculously improve after they receive new government business. Among the company's employees is former President George H.W. Bush. Among the group's investors until late October was the bin Laden family of Saudi Arabia. Another administration would have regarded the elder Bush's role at Carlisle as unseemly. This administration apparently does not. And Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld recently gave his old college wrestling partner Frank Carlucci, head of Carlisle, a very nice gift. Mr. Rumsfeld decided to proceed with the much-criticized Crusader artillery system, which even the Pentagon wanted to cancel. The result was another turnaround for a Carlisle-owned company. Sad to say... None of this is clearly illegal. It just stinks to high heaven. That's why the Bush administration will try to keep the Enron story narrowly focused on one company during its death throes. Just remember that the real story is much bigger. Two Three Many, February 1st, 2002. Here's a scary question. How many more Enrons are out there? Even now, the conventional wisdom is that Enron was uniquely crooked. Okay, other companies have engaged in aggressive accounting, the art form formerly known as fraud. But how likely is it that other major companies will turn out, behind their imposing facades, to be little more than pyramid schemes? Alas, it's all too likely. I can't tell you which corporate icons will turn out to be made out of paper mache, but I'd be very surprised if we don't have two, three, even many Enrons in our future. Why do I say this? Like any crime, a pyramid scheme requires means, motive, and opportunity. Lately, all three have been there in abundance. Means. We now know how easily a company that earns a modest profit, or even loses money, can dress itself up to create the appearance of high profitability. Just the simple trick of paying employees, not with straight salary, which counts as an expense, but with stock options, which don't, can have a startling effect on a company's reported profits. According to the British economist Andrew Smithers, in 1998 Cisco reported a profit of $1.35 billion. If it had counted the market value of the stock options it issued as an expense, it would have reported a loss of $4.9 billion. And stock options are only one of a panoply of techniques available to make the bottom line look artificially good. Motive. The purpose of inflating earnings is, of course, to drive up the price of the stock. But why do companies want to do that? One answer is that a high stock price helps a company grow. It makes it easier to raise money, to acquire other companies, to attract employees, and so on. 
And no doubt most managers have puffed up their stock out of a genuine desire to make their companies grow. But as we watch top executives walk away rich while the companies they ran collapse, there are cases worse than Enron. The founder of Global Crossing has apparently walked away from bankruptcy with $750 million. It's clear that we should also think about the incentives of the managers themselves. Ask not what a high stock price can do for your company. Ask what it can do for your personal bottom line. Not incidentally, a high stock price facilitates the very accounting tricks that companies use to create phantom profits, further driving up the stock price. It's Ponzi time. But what about opportunity? A confluence of three factors in the late 1990s opened the door for financial scams on a scale unseen for generations. First was the rise of the new economy. New technologies have, without question, created new opportunities and shaken up the industrial order. But that creates the kind of confusion in which scams flourish. How do you know whether a company has really found a highly profitable new economy niche or is just faking it? Second was the stock market bubble. As Robert Schiller pointed out in his book, Irrational Exuberance, a rising market is like a natural Ponzi scheme, in which each successive wave of investors generates gains for the last wave, making everything look great until you run out of suckers. What he didn't point out, but now seems obvious, is that in such an environment, it's also easy to run deliberate pyramid schemes. When the public believes in magic, it's springtime for charlatans. And finally, there was and is a permissive legal environment. Once upon a time, the threat of lawsuits hung over companies and auditors that engaged in sharp accounting practices. But in 1995, Congress, overriding a veto by Bill Clinton, passed the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, which made such suits far more difficult. Soon accounting firms, the companies they audited, and the investment banks that sold their stock got very cozy indeed. And here, too, one must look not only at the motives of corporations, but at the personal motives of executives. We now know that Enron managers gave their investment bankers, not their investment banks, but the individual bankers, an opportunity to invest in the shell companies they used to hide debt and siphon off money. Want to bet that similar deals didn't take place at many other firms? I hope that Enron turns out to be unique, but I'll be very surprised. The Insider Game, July 12, 2002. The current crisis in American capitalism isn't just about the specific details, about tricky accounting, stock options, loans to executives, and so on. It's about the way the game has been rigged on behalf of insiders. And the Bush administration is full of such insiders. That's why President Bush cannot get away with merely rhetorical opposition to executive wrongdoers. To give the most extreme example so far, how can we take his moralizing seriously when Thomas White, whose division of Enron generated $500 million in phony profits and who sold $12 million in stock just before the company collapsed, is still Secretary of the Army? Yet everything Mr. Bush has said and done lately shows that he doesn't get it. Asked about the Aloha Petroleum deal at his former company, Harkin Energy, in which big profits were recorded on a sale that was paid for by the company itself, a transaction that obviously had no meaning except as a way to inflate reported earnings, he responded, there was an honest difference of opinion. Sometimes things aren't exactly black and white when it comes to accounting procedures. And he still opposes both reforms that would reduce the incentives for corporate scams, such as requiring companies to count executive stock options against profits, and reforms that would make it harder to carry out such scams, such as not allowing accountants to take consulting fees from the same firms they audit. The closest thing to a substantive proposal in Mr. Bush's tough-talking, nearly content-free speech on Tuesday was his call for extra punishment for executives convicted of fraud. But that's an empty threat. In reality, top executives rarely get charged with crimes. Not a single indictment has yet been brought in the Enron affair, and even Chainsaw Al Dunlap, a serial book cooker, faces only a civil suit. And they almost never get convicted. Accounting issues are technical enough to confuse many juries. Expensive lawyers make the most of that confusion. And if all else fails, big-name executives have friends in high places who protect them. In this, as in so much of the corporate governance issue, the current wave of scandal is prefigured by President Bush's own history. An aside, 
Some pundits have tried to dismiss questions about Mr. Bush's business career as unfair. It was long ago and hence irrelevant. Yet many of those same pundits thought it was perfectly appropriate to spend seven years and $70 million investigating a failed land deal that was even further in Bill Clinton's past. And if they want something more recent, how about reporting on the story of Mr. Bush's extraordinarily lucrative investment in the Texas Rangers, which became so profitable because of a highly incestuous web of public policy and private deals? As in the case of Harkin, no hard work is necessary. Joe Connison laid it all out in Harper's almost two years ago. But the Harkin story still has more to teach us, because the SEC investigation into Mr. Bush's stock sale is a perfect illustration of why his tough talk won't scare well-connected malefactors. Mr. Bush claims that he was vetted by the SEC. In fact, the agency's investigation was peculiarly perfunctory. It somehow decided that Mr. Bush's perfectly timed stock sale did not reflect inside information without interviewing him or any other members of Harkin's board. Maybe top officials at the SEC felt they already knew enough about Mr. Bush. His father, the president, had appointed a good friend as SEC chairman. And the general counsel, who would normally make decisions about legal action, had previously been George W. Bush's personal lawyer. He negotiated the purchase of the Texas Rangers. I am not making this up. Most corporate wrongdoers won't be quite as well-connected as the young Mr. Bush. But like him, they will expect, and probably receive, kid-glove treatment. In an interesting parallel, today's SEC, which claims to be investigating the highly questionable accounting at Halliburton that turned a loss into a reported profit, has yet to interview the CEO at the time, Dick Cheney. The bottom line is that in the last week, any hopes you might have had that Mr. Bush would make a break from his past and champion desperately needed corporate reform have been dashed. Mr. Bush is not a real reformer. He just plays one on TV. Business as Usual, October 22, 2002 The mood among business lobbyists, according to a jubilant official at the Heritage Foundation, is one of optimism bordering on giddiness. They expect the elections on November 5th to put Republicans in control of all three branches of government and have their wish lists ready. It's the domestic equivalent of planning for post-war Iraq, says the official. The White House also apparently expects Christmas in November. In fact, it is so confident that it has already given business lobbyists the gift they want most, an end to all this nonsense about corporate reform. Back in July, George W. Bush declared, corporate misdeeds will be found and will be punished, touting a new law that authorizes new funding for investigators and technology at the Securities and Exchange Commission to uncover wrongdoing. But that was then. Don't you know there's a war on? The first big step in undermining reform came when Harvey Pitt, chairman of the SEC, backtracked on plans to appoint a strong and independent figure to head a new accounting oversight board. But that was only a prelude. The SEC has been underfunded for years, and most observers, including Richard Breeden, who headed the agency when Mr. Bush's father was president, thought that even the budget Mr. Bush signed back in July was seriously inadequate. But now the administration wants to cancel most of the new funding Mr. Bush boasted about. Administration officials claim that the SEC can still do its job with a much smaller budget. But the SEC is ludicrously underfinanced. Staff lawyers and accountants are paid half what they could get in the private sector, usually find themselves heavily outnumbered by the legal departments of the companies they investigate, and often must do their own typing and copying. Officials say there are investigations that they should pursue, but can't for lack of resources, and the new law expands the SEC's responsibilities. So what's going on? Here's a parallel. Since 1995, Congress has systematically forced the Internal Revenue Service to shrink its operations. The number of auditors has fallen by 28%. Yet it's clear that giving the IRS more money would actually reduce the federal budget deficit. The agency estimates that it loses at least $30 billion a year in uncollected taxes, mainly because high-income taxpayers believe they can get away with tax evasion. So starving the IRS isn't about saving money. It's about protecting affluent tax cheats. Similarly, top officials don't really believe that the SEC can do its job with less money. The whole point is to prevent the agency from doing its job. In retrospect, it's hard to see why anyone believed that our current leadership was serious about corporate reform. 
To an extent unprecedented in recent history, this is a government of, by, and for corporate insiders. I'm not just talking about influence. I'm talking about personal career experience. The Bush administration contains more former CEOs than any previous administration. But as James Sawicki put it in The New Yorker, almost none of the CEOs on the Bush team headed competitive entrepreneurial businesses. Instead, they come out of a world of crony capitalism, in which whom you know is more important than what you do and how you do it. Why would they turn their backs on that world? And don't forget the personal incentives. Almost all of those ex-CEOs in the administration became wealthy thanks to the connections they had acquired in Washington. The exception is Mr. Bush himself, who became wealthy thanks to the connections his father had acquired in Washington. This process continues. Senator Phil Graham, who pushed through legislation that exempted Enron's trading practices from regulation while his wife sat on the company's board, is retiring and taking a new job. He's going to UBS Warburg, the company that bought Enron's trading operation. Somehow, crusaders against business abuse don't get similar offers. The bottom line is that you shouldn't worry about those TV images of men in suits doing the perp walk. That was for public consumption. Now that the public is focused on other things, it's back to business, insider business, as usual.